Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Some of you might recognize the name Karl Barth. Karl Barth is a Swiss German theologian of the 20th century. He was probably the leading theologian of the 20th century. In 1962, he did a lecture tour through the United States. And at a lecture at the University of Chicago, there was a question and answer time afterwards. And one of the persons went to the mic and said, Dr. Bart, can you summarize your theology in one sentence? Now, if you know the work of Karl Barth, I've got 20 volumes up here on the top shelf. Dr. Bart, how can you summarize your theology in one sentence? And Dr. Bart said, yes, I can. In the words of a song, I learned at my mother's knee, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Not just my mother tells me so. Not just the church tells me so. Not just my heart tells me so. That, that's really dicey because sometimes your heart will say yes, and sometimes I do something and my heart says, I don't think he does. <laughs> Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. I would not know that he loves me. I would not know the nature of that love apart from the Bible. Have you heard the name Sally Lloyd-Jones, any of you? She's a New York Times best-selling author, and she wrote the Jesus Storybook Bible. She wrote it for children, but I think she had um, us childlike adults in mind, too. It's for both young and old. In fact, if you've never read the Bible before and you're intimidated by it, I'd recommend you get this the Jesus Storybook Bible. Uh, it gives you a great overview and very simple language and with lots of pictures. <laughs> but I'd like to read her introduction. It's called The Story and the Song. The heavens are singing about how great God is. The skies are shouting it out. See what God has made. Day after day, night after night, they are speaking to us. And then she writes, God wrote, I love you. He wrote it in the sky, on the earth, and under the sea. He wrote his message everywhere because God created everything in his world to reflect him like a mirror, to show us what he is like, to help us know him, to make our hearts sing. The way a kitten chases her tail, the way red poppies grow wild, the way a dolphin swims. And God put it into words too. He wrote it in a book called the Bible. Then there's these really cool pictures of people. I should have made slides about of these for you. Now, some people think the Bible is a book of rules telling you what you should and shouldn't do. The Bible certainly does have some rules in it. They show you how life works best. But the Bible isn't mainly about you and about what you should be doing. It's about God and about what God has done. Other people think the Bible is a book of heroes showing you people you should copy. The Bible does have some, some heroes in it, but as you will soon find out, most of the people in the Bible aren't heroes at all. They make some big mistakes, sometimes on purpose. They get afraid and run away. At times, they're downright mean. No. The Bible isn't a book of rules or a book of heroes. The Bible is most of all a story. It's an adventure story about a young hero who comes from a far country to win back his lost treasure. It's a love story about a brave prince who leaves his palace, his throne, everything to rescue the ones he loves. It's like the most wonderful of fairy tales that has come true in real life. You see, the best thing about this story is it's true. There are lots of stories in the Bible, but all the stories are telling one big story. The story of how God loves his children and comes to rescue him. It takes the whole Bible to tell this story. 
And at the center of the story, there's a baby. Every story in the Bible whispers his name. He's like the missing piece in a puzzle, the piece that makes all the other pieces fit together. And suddenly, you see a beautiful picture. Jesus loves me. This I know because the story of the Bible tells me so. Now, I would like to read tonight one story in the big story that makes all of this more real. It's found in the last chapter of the gospel according to Luke. In the Bible has an Old Testament and a New Testament. And the New Testament begins with four gospels. There are four biographies of John written by four different people, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I want to read from Luke and read especially from Luke 24. This story happens on the afternoon of the first Easter. On the afternoon of the day that it became clear that Jesus had defeated death. Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 45. Let's see, that's, uh, I'll, I'll read from the one that you, the version that you have there instead of mine. Now, that same day, two of them, two disciples, were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. Next slide. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, Jesus asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus explained to them what was said in all the scripture concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Emmaus, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost gone over. So he went in to stay with them. I can't resist making the observation that throughout scripture, any time anyone asked Jesus to stay with him, he did. When he was at table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened. And they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. Then they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven, and those with them assembled together, saying, it is true, the Lord has risen, and he's appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be to you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. Then he said to them, 
why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your mind? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And, and while they still not believe, did not believe because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. Now, what is the message of this story? Clearly, the, the, the basic message is that the crucified Jesus is alive. He is now and forever the living Jesus. But then the message is about how we meet the risen and living Jesus. I think Jesus takes these two disciples and then the rest of the disciples through this event to answer that one question because he's going to leave in a while, he's going to ascend in heaven. And then the question will be, how now do we meet the risen and living Jesus? It's important to note, by the way, that Jesus had been walking with them along the way and they did not recognize it. That's true of you and me. He is with us all day long, and for the most part, we do not recognize him. But this story teaches us that Jesus makes himself known to us in two ways. Verse 30, he took the bread, blessed it, and breaking it, he began giving it to them. And then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. Why were their eyes opened? Because that motion of blessing the bread, breaking the bread, and giving it to them would have taken their minds back to the time that he fed the 5,000 and the 4,000. And it would have taken them back to that night before going to the cross when gathered in the upper room, he instituted the Lord's Supper. So Jesus is teaching us that one of the ways in which we meet him right now is in the Lord's Supper. But there's a second way, and it's verse 32. The two disciples say, were not our hearts burning within us? While he was speaking to us on the road and while he was opening the scriptures to us? This text is teaching us that we meet Jesus in the Bible in the open Bible. Verse 27, Luke says that Jesus was showing them how all of these texts in the scripture from the beginning to the end of the Old Testament were about Jesus concerning himself. Verse 44, Jesus says that beginning with the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, they're all about him. So we meet Jesus as the pages of the Bible are opened. And then there's verse 45. Then he opened their minds to understand the scripture. Jesus here is teaching us that we need to experience a, a kind of a double opening to meet him. First of all, Jesus must open the Bible for us. He must open it in such a way that we meet him. And then he needs to open our eyes to what he's opened. Jesus is saying the Bible is all about him and that he chooses to meet us in it. Yes, through creation, through friends, through worship, through walking, through praying, but most directly in the open Bible. I've lived long enough now to make this simple observation. Some disciples began with great zeal great passion, but over the decades do not continue in that, and towards the end of their life live a compromised and flat Christian life. Others begin with great zeal, 
a great passion. And over the lives, that zeal and passion grows. The difference between those two people is whether or not they spend time in the Bible. It's as simple as that. It's as simple as that. So the question we wanted to address tonight is, how do we approach reading the Bible in a way that this encounter with Jesus happens? Now, I don't want to suggest there's only one way, but I want to give you the basic way I was given at the beginning that I still work with. You will modify it for yourself. And I would imagine looking at some of you, you already have well-developed habits of reading the Bible. And maybe later on, we can hear you share some of that. So I've broken up my notes into three categories. One I'm, I, I'm calling the setting. The second I'm calling basic process. And then the third I'm gonna call advanced reading. <laughs> so that's what I'm gonna walk through. Now I'm gonna walk through that. And um, this is where I wish we were in the same room so I could see your eyes, I could tell how you're responding and I would know how to, how to uh, direct my comments. But let me just walk through this and I'll see whether we have time to actually take a couple texts and practice it. And then I would love to interact with you. Um, I, I've, told, I've told the team, yes, I love doing expos expository preaching and teaching, but I really love the question and answer time. That's what I live for, okay? So I'm gonna talk about a basic setting so that this encounter takes place a basic process, process, and then talk a little bit about more advanced reading. Okay, a basic setting. And here's what I commend to you. You want a regular time in which you're going to open the Bible. May I suggest to you that it should be the first thing in the morning. I know there are morning people and evening people. So those of you who are really evening people, then it can be later at night. I'm a morning person. I can't imagine reading my Bible at 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> at any rate, we're different on that. But whatever it is, it's, it's a regular time. And may I suggest that it's a minimum of 15 to 20 minutes. Now, if it's going to be in the morning, I encourage you to ask the Lord to wake you up. He wants this for you more than you do. He wants this for me more than I do. Isaiah chapter 50, verse 4. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to listen as a disciple. I don't know when it was, maybe 1980 or so. An older pastor and I were talking about no, it must have been 82 or so, because we had our first son who came to us in 81. And we were talking about this discipline of the early morning Bible reading time. And, and I was telling him, because my son gets up so early, I'm having to get up earlier and earlier and earlier. And, and I don't want to set my alarm to go off, lest I wake up my wife and wake up my son. So Bob Whitaker was his name, said to me, don't set your alarm. Ask the Lord to wake you up. He has done that for me every day since. Jeremy, you and I were in Hong Kong, different time zone. I didn't set my alarm. He always wakes me up because he wants this for me more than I want it for me. So a regular time. Uh, now that's gonna be different if you're a mother with a whole bunch of kids. <laughs> Um, you know, all that's gonna be different for us. So I don't wanna be legalistic about that, but uh, the regularity of it is, is key. You regularly eat meals, regularly exercise, and you want regular time in the word. Second part of this basic setting is a special place. Choose a place within your home or within your area where you are going to meet him. Uh, that needs to be a place where you can be alone, and a place with minimal distraction. I don't think we can find a place in our world anymore without some distraction. So that's why I use the word minimal distraction. A special place. Why a regular place? Because then you're not having to come to terms with the space. If it's a different place every day, you're going to be spending time looking subconsciously. 
at this place and trying to get comfortable in it. So if you have a regular place where you're already comfortable, you can just step into that. I would encourage you to have a notebook. Um, a notebook where you can make notes of what you've learned, where you can share impressions from what you've read, where you can record observations, and where you can also write down questions that you have. I want to encourage you, and please don't hear this as some kind of pietistic, legalistic action, <laughs> but I want to encourage you to have a hard copy of the Bible and not use your iPhone. Whoa. <laughs> Why not use your iPhone and why have a hard copy? For two reasons. With the hard copy, you can see more of the text in front of you. On the iPhone, you can only see a few verses at a time. So you can't see how the text goes together. And the other thing is in using your iPhone, you've got all those distractions that come, those notices about the late, great, latest great news or about the events that are coming during the day. So again, I don't want to be legalistic. I don't want to be a fuddy-duddy about that. But um, I, I just keep the iPhone in a different part of the building at the time before doing this. I wouldn't check emails before doing this either because now your mind is on all of those. So put it away. Take out a hard copy. If you don't have a hard copy, just contact Jeremy and I'm sure he'll send you one. <laughs> I noticed a lot of copies at the church office, right? So I'm, I'm being honest. Yeah, we got Bibles that if anyone needs a hard copy of the Bible, we would love to get you one. So, yep. so, right so uh, we're, we're hard copy Christians. <laughs> uh, again, I, I recognize that maybe, maybe you can make Windows, uh, iPhone and Windows work. But I can't. The biggest reason is you want to see more of the text in front of you at one time. And then some kind of symbol in this space that reminds you that the Lord is present. Um, I have uh, a little candle holder. And my routine in the morning is to come into my room, open the two shades, light this candle, then turn on my light, go get a cup of coffee, and then come back and sit in my chair to do my quiet time. Lighting that candle is just a way of reminding me of the presence of the Lord. And during the pandemic, it has been very powerful. Lighting that candle is a way of saying the light shines in the darkness and the darkness does not overcome it. I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in the darkness, but have the light of life. So some symbol that helps you remember that this is about the encounter and that he is already here. Does that make sense? So that's kind of a, a, the, the basic setting of this kind of discipline. I'll go on. Jeremy, should I just keep moving on? Okay. Now, let me talk a little bit about a basic process. I think you want to begin with prayer. Now, a perfectly good prayer is, I showed up. <laughs> the Lord is pleased with just that much. I showed up. But let me give you a prayer that would be based on what we read in Luke 24. And I can repeat this if you, if you like the words. Here I am. I want to meet you. Please open up the word to me. Please open yourself to me in your open word. And please open my mind and heart to what you open up to me. I'll say that again. Here I am, Lord. I want to meet you. Please open your word to me. Please open yourself to me in your open word. And then open my mind and my heart and probably add will to what you have opened up to me. Then you would have this a passage you're looking at. We can talk a little bit later about how we select the passage. Let's say it was this Luke 24 passage. You read through the whole text, unless something along the way really grabs hold of your heart. You know, you, you just need to stop there. But you read through the whole passage, and some days you may need to read it twice. I find that 
when I'm reading Psalms, which I do every day, uh, sometimes the first reading through, my mind is still too distracted. So I need to go through it a little slower the second time. One of the things I found helpful is if I'm still distracted, which, which can happen, right? <laughs> you can have a bad dream or you just have so much to happen the day before or you got too much to do the, in that day. I find that if I read the text the second or third time out loud, I not only hear the text through my eye, I actually hear it through my ear. And then having read the text, I ask basic questions, the kind of newspaper or journalistic questions. Who is involved in the story? What is going on? When did this take place? Where did it take place? So this Luke 24, who? Two disciples, Cleopas and an unnamed person. You might be interested to find out who that other unnamed person is. We're not so sure, but I think it's his wife, Mary. What is going on? They're discouraged. Jesus was crucified on Friday. This is Sunday. They put all their hopes in Jesus, and, and now he's, he's gone. They don't know what's happened to him. When is this taking place? It's taking place on Easter afternoon, as I said. And, and where is it taking place? They're walking away from Jerusalem. They're going home to Emmaus. They're going back to life as normal. They had expected something very different, and now it's all been shattered. So now I know what's going on in this story. I know where I am. Then I want to ask more pointed questions. Questions like, this is the most important question I want to ask of any text, whether it be the works of Moses, the prophets, the Psalms, the Gospels, the letters, or the book of Revelation. I want to ask, what do I learn in this text about Jesus? Or about his father or his spirit? So I guess you could say, what do I learn here about the triune God? But since Jesus says all of scripture is about him, that's why I focused on that. What do I learn here about Jesus? Who is he? What has he done, is doing, and will do? Now, in this text, we learn that Jesus is the crucified one who believed he must be crucified because he'd read the scriptures. We learn from Jesus that he believes the Old Testament says Messiah was to be crucified before he enters into his glory. We learn that Jesus, as I mentioned before, walks with us when we do not know it. Uh, wonderful news. I want to hang on to that after reading this passage. What do I learn about what he has done, is doing, and will do? Well, he's died for the sins of the world. We learn that he's going to ascend to his father. We learn, and, and on, on it goes. Now, I'm writing those things down in my notebook. Why did I put them in the notebook? I may never read that notebook again. But if I write something down, it, it has an effect of working into the memory more. If I just think it, uh, it can be there. But writing it down, seeing it, um, drives it deeper in. Another question, a pointed question would be, what especially grabs me today? Of all the things in this passage, what leaps out at me the most? I would then write that down. And here's the thing that to do is I pray it back to him. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you dot, dot, dot. So let's take this Luke 24 passage. I read it a couple of times today, and then we read it tonight. I, I think that what especially grabs me is that Jesus wanted to make sure the disciples knew that when he ascends out of their sight into heaven, he does so in a body. That the resurrection is a bodily event, that Jesus is alive in some sort of bodily form. That, that has huge implications, and it grabs me today because it reaffirms it's good to be human and it reminds me that though my body is decaying now, one day I'm going to have a body like his. So I, I would then say, thank you, Lord, that this is our destiny, that you're going to make us like you. 
Another pointed question would be, is there a promise to claim or to stand upon? Has he made a promise in this text? Um, uh, he will in verse 46 and following, where he'll talk about that we are going to be clothed with power from on high. Not every text will have a promise. So not every day you're going to have one of those. Is there a promise to claim? Is there a command to obey? In this passage, um, uh, the only command I see is in verse 39, see my hands and my feet. The only command he gives us here is look at me, focus in my direction. After uh, the, where we stop the reading, he will say, um, you will be my witnesses. Um, although that's a promise, not a command. You will be my witnesses when you're clothed from on high. And then, so I'm writing those down in the notebook. And then is there a question or more that I need to pursue? Um, that is, where do I need more help to better understand what this is all about? Now, I've been reading the Bible for a half a century or more, and I can tell you, I want to make sure I'm saying this accurately, 95% of the time when I'm reading a text, I have questions. I need more help. This morning, I was reading in John 18. I'm slowly going through John, and John refers to um, himself, he calls himself the other disciple, <laughs> who was known to the high priest. Now, John is a fisherman from Galilee. How was he known to the leading religious figure of Jerusalem? So I need some help. I don't know this connection. Now, I happen to have a whole bunch of commentaries. I pulled them all down. I put down three or four of them. I wasn't satisfied with their answers. So that's written in my journal. I've got work to do. Now, when am I going to do that? It's there. I don't know. I didn't have time the rest of the day, and I won't tomorrow. So I don't know when I'm going to get back to it, but at least it's there, that question. So the questions would be, what do I learn here about Jesus? Who is he? What has he done, doing, and will do? What especially grabs me today, is there a promise to claim? Is there a command to obey? Are there questions to pursue? And then I would end that basic time by giving thanks for whatever it is that he has shown you. And, and, and that has a way of cementing what he has shown you. Thank you, dear Lord, that you showed us whatever out of this passage. I hope that makes sense. It's kind of a basic way of going at Bible study. Let's see how we're doing on the time. Let me just for the sake of, of um, well, Jeremy, uh, what's, what is your uh, sense say? Should we stop for a moment? No, we're doing good. We got so much time. We're all just eating it up. So keep going. Okay. Now that's rich enough. We're going to get enough out of the scriptures doing those basic um, uh, steps. Now I, I will call what I call advanced study. You remember in Chris's sermon about being rooted in the word? Remember that exhortation he says? A lot of you need to stop reading the Bible and start studying the Bible. <laughs> what I think, Chris, you meant by that is paying even more attention to what is going on in the passage. Am I right, Chris? Instead of just whipping through it, right? Sort of. Okay, you can come back to me later on that. Now, this will apply more for reading the epistles, reading the letters. And we're in this series in Ephesians, so this is going to apply very directly to Ephesians. You want to note <clears throat> how the passage begins and ends. That can be a clue to the basic burden of the text. How does it begin? How does it end? A lot of passages will begin and end on similar notes. This is especially true, by the way, in Old Testament narrative. In the book of Genesis, most of the stories begin and end with similar language. It's a way of enveloping it and pointing you to the major point. Are there any repeated words or phrases in the text? That's going to be a clue to the writer's passion. Take a note of all the verbs that are in the 
indicative. The indicative is the is uh, tense. This is true. This is what is true now. Note the verbs that have that indicative. Then note the verbs that have the imperative. Imperative is the command mood. The indicative will give you a clue to the author's basic convictions about the world, about God, about discipleship, about who we are. The commands will give you uh, a, a picture, a, 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 will give you a clue to what he wants us, what, what he wants to see happen as a result of us embracing those indicatives. Then take note of any participial phrases. You remember from basic English classes, participles are those words that end in ing. And, and participles will either flow out of the indicative verb or out of the imperative verb. And ask how are these participles related to the indicative or the imperative? Take note of words like nevertheless, but, I, I've always said I'd love to do a, a series on the whole Bible. I would build it around the word but, especially but God. Look at all those places where it says but God. And we're going to run into a number of them in the, in the book of Ephesians. So watch for words like but, nevertheless, and especially therefore. You, you've heard, I would imagine, this little ditty. It's when you run across a therefore in the Bible, you are to ask what it is there for. The therefore is pointing back to what has been said. The big example of this is the letter to the Ephesians. In chapters one to three, Paul is speaking in the indicative. He's telling us all these wonderful things that are true. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. On and on he goes for three chapters. Then at chapter four, verse one, Therefore, walk worthy of the calling to which you've been called. And then for chapters four, five, and six, I think we have six therefores. Therefore, 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 therefore. And it's a way of saying, I've told you all this indicative, and now this indicative has implications, and here now are the imperatives. So watch for those transition words. And as you do this, can you see if there's one main point to the passage? And you found that one main point, if you can show how all the other parts of the passage relate to it. So let's, let me take this out of the air and put it into the ground a little bit. I think I still have time. Let's look at a text in Ephesians and we'll look at it further down the road. Um, uh, I, I didn't ask them to put a slide on there, so we don't have that. So if you'll Open your Bible, if you probably have an iPhone tonight, I'll excuse you for that, because I didn't tell you to bring a hard copy. <laughs> okay, Ephesians 5, 15 and following. Th this would be a, a perfect example to illustrate indicative, imperative, uh, and all of that. 5, 15, therefore. Now, when you're reading a letter, you want to read any little one part in light of the whole part. And this therefore will take you back to for one, therefore I, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. 417, therefore I firm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles. 425, therefore laying aside all falsehood, speak truth to one another. 51, therefore be imitators of God. 57, therefore do not be partakers with them who walk in darkness. Then 515, therefore. So this is the last of a series of therefores. Okay, therefore be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, 
always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. And most translations have, be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. If you have a study Bible, you'll have a little note in verse 21, right on top that word and, and it will take you to a little marginal reading. Um, I'll show you mine. So on top of verse 21, there is a little number. It takes you into the margin reading, and it'll say literally, being subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Okay, you look at this passage, therefore. Now there's a series of imperatives. Be careful how you walk, not as wise, but unwise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. Be careful how you walk, be wise, make the most of your time. There's one sermon in itself. <laughs> So then, do not get drunk. I mean, do not, sorry, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. In the scriptures, the fool is the one who does not want to know the will of the Lord. A fool can be very intelligent, but doesn't want the will of the Lord. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. There's a series of, imp of, of imperatives. Uh, be careful how you walk. Do not be foolish. Be filled with the Spirit. You see that? And then you have a series of participles. Spe verse 19, speaking to one another, singing, making melody with your heart. Verse 20, always giving thanks for all things. And verse 21, being subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Okay. I've made the observation, I, is there any uh, indicative there? Uh, the days are evil. Um, getting drunk is dissipation. But the, he's majoring here on imperatives. So I want to ask then, what is the major imperative of this short text? And I think you would agree with me. It's a, at the end of verse 18, be filled with the spirit. That's how to be wise. That's how to understand the will of the Lord. The will of the Lord is be filled with the Spirit. Now, I want to find out what that means. What does it mean to be filled? How do I be filled? What's my part in it? Or is this the work of the Spirit? All those kinds of questions are going to come to mind. And then you have a series of participles. Now, why are those participles there? They are the result of the imperative. Paul is saying, when you're filled with the Spirit, you find yourself speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. When you're filled with the Spirit, you find yourself singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. When you're filled with the Spirit, you find yourself giving thanks for all things in the name of the Lord. And verse 21, when you're filled with the Spirit, you find yourself being subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Some translations translate verse 21 be subject, they change the participle into a command. It's not a command. <laughs> being subject to another human being requires a miracle. It requires the filling of the Spirit. So the one main point that will come out of that passage for me is be filled with the Spirit, and I can account for everything else as it relates to that one major point. A am I making sense? That's just a, a simple way of going at that. But that's a result of paying attention to those kinds of things. So then, after I've done that kind of work, then I would want to ask, so what is the Lord calling me to be and do about what I learned? I write that down, and I end that with the prayer, so, Lord, help me. And whatever it is. In light of this passage, so, Holy Spirit, Fill me with yourself. So instead of complaining and grumbling, I sing and give thanks. And I can be full of joy. And I can submit my life to the life of another human being. Amen. Get my briefcase out the door to work. Of course, I'm working at home now because of isolation. Well, that's... Uh, a little overview of some of the ways of going at uh, studying the Bible. Um, Jeremy, over to you, how you want to go from here. 
Yeah, Daryl, thank you so much. And um, one of the sadnesses of not being in the same room is it's it's hard to feel and hear all of our appreciation, but we're just so thankful for you walking us through this. I know that shared across every screen, even those uh, who don't have video on there's This is really rich and helpful. And and then there's all this simple stuff that's also just so practically helpful. I just feel really um, challenged even again where I'm at in my walk with the Lord and season, just that, that thought of the familiarity of a place where that gets comfortable to go in the morning. I mean, like that's just a, I can see how that would help my scattered self uh, be more and more grounded. And so, um, and then, and then, so guys, I want to share that um, I, I shared slides a few times. I'm going to, in a few minutes, post those in the chat just so that you can take those notes that way. Um, but I, I can only do one thing at a time. So we'll get to that in a minute. But um, let's let's move into some questions. And just again, um, a reminder that you can send questions. Probably the simplest way for me is to send them a direct message into the, into the chat. But uh, text is fine. Some of you have already been sending uh, them that way. And that's amazing. Um, so Daryl, there's already a ton of great questions. I try to order these in a way that I think um, help, will help frame some stuff for people. Uh, so here's one that's um, really good and, and just will serve everyone understanding background. Uh, the question is, besides uh, historical proximity, why should Paul's writings have more authority than those of otherwise insightful theologians um, like N.D. Wright or the Desert Fathers? So even like some of the early, early disciples, um, and I think you get the question, so I'll let you speak to it. Oh, that's, that's a very thoughtful question. Very thoughtful. Uh, and you answered it when you used the word apostle. That word apostle, we read by too quickly. Apostle, there, to be an apostle, there were two basic requirements. One, you have to have seen the risen Lord. And two, he must have commissioned you to be his spokesperson. So an apostle is someone to whom Jesus made himself visibly real. That's why the apostle Paul has, that's why the book of Acts spends so much time on Paul's conversion. The other disciples had spent three years with Jesus and seen him. And now Paul's credentials are there in the fact that Jesus showed up to him. So I have seen the Lord. I can't say that. N.T. Wright can't say that. We can say that in one sense. Yes, I've seen him through the word. I, I've seen his character, but I have not seen him face to face. I long for that. I live for that day. That's the promise of Revelation 22. We'll see his face. But I haven't seen him. The Desert Fathers haven't seen him face to face. No, none of the great theologians have. So the apostle ranks above everybody. In fact, above the prophets. Because uh, not all of them saw the Lord um, and then commissioned to be his unique spokesperson. That, does that help? It's awesome. It helps. So that's why then I, I think uh, it was Jason, um, both, both Jason and Chris, uh, Jason, I'm um, Chris, and the, the rooted in the word sermon and Jason last week on why we want to work through a whole book. They both of them use this with their hands. We're submitting ourselves to the teaching right. of an apostle. <laughs> I, I was talking to a man, a pastor in Toronto recently about a very controversial issue. Um, and uh, a, a certain church leader in another uh, part of the church is moving away from the clear teaching of, uh, of, of Paul in a certain section. And, and my friend said to that other pastor, oh, so you now have a higher stance than the apostle. He doesn't. None of us do. So we submit right. ourselves to the apostle. And in the process, we're submitting ourselves to Jesus. Um, um, I realize this is, uh, there could be a whole class on many of these questions. That's often how it is in Q&A. But I, uh, I want to um, ask this as well, because it's, it, it speaks to something connected, I think. Um, and that is just like, how do you understand and put in their proper place um, uh, other writings uh, at the time or later, like the Gospel of Thomas or the Gospel of Mary. And uh, there's just there's just been some questions about that. So oh, I'll, I'll right. throw it to you. We've got a very educated um, audience here, very educated. And that is that is a really difficult question and, and a subtle question. Um, there, there, there are two ways in which the church has gone on that. Um, 
do these other gospels really come from the pen of the people who claim to have written them? Um, the gospel of Thomas comes way too late to have actually come from Thomas. And the other criteria they use is, is the content of these other gospels congruous with the four gospels? And in the case of the gospel of Thomas, no, it's, it's not. There's a lot that's similar, but there's a lot that just flies directly in the face of what we know from the other four gospels. So over the years, the church would use, would use those two criteria. Um, now, they can still be useful because they're telling us what certain parts of the church were thinking about Jesus at those particular times. Yeah, thank you, Derek. You're, you do an amazing job at focusing us in and, uh, and summarizing things in a way that I think serves the community tonight. I'm going to, um, no, I think this is really good. I, I'm just, um, before we move into some more, there's a bunch of practical questions about Bible reading. I want to spend the majority of time on that. Um, but just one more question that's, uh, there's a couple of questions that kind of swirl around this idea of like, is there a, are there different questions I should be asking when I'm reading the Old Testament as opposed to the New? Um, and so even in terms of some of the things you're walking through, I know you mentioned, um, you know, asking questions through all of scripture, uh, like even like, where do I see Jesus in this passage? But maybe um, what are some tips for asking those questions and leaning in when it feels like the stories are unrelated or hard to, or hard to connect the dots, specifically in the Old Testament? I'm hearing a, a number of different questions in that. Is, it, is the question about the difficulty of reading Old Testament because we don't know the historical context? You know, it, it or is it so much of the Old Testament is offensive? No, I'm more connected to what are the best questions to ask when reading the Old Testament in relation to what you were, are they the same questions or are there any other ones that might be helpful for those newer to it? Okay. I think I would still begin with the question, what is God revealing about himself in this text? And in what way does it point to Jesus? Jesus says he's in the text. You don't have to bring him there. He's there. So there's going to be some revelation of him there. The book, uh, the author of the letter to the Hebrews says, in past times, God revealed himself, spoke for himself in various and partial ways, but then in his son most fully. So what are those partial and various ways in which God spoke in that particular text? That speech is going to be refined and clarified and beautified more fully in the incarnation in Jesus himself. So Chris used a great analogy in his sermon he says, you need to read all of the Old Testament through the sieve of Jesus. <laughs> so these stories go through what we know of Jesus. So that what comes through that sieve is what then we embrace. Uh, because just because a story is in the Old Testament doesn't mean God affirms it. Right. There are stories that are just told because they're the part of the history of Israel. But God doesn't affirm it. I think Chris used the example of polygamy. Yeah. David has many wives. God is not saying that's a good thing. <laughs> In fact, it turns out to be a, his Achilles heel. Um, uh, so yeah. that has to be read in light of the increasing fuller revelation that now takes place in Jesus. Um, yeah, fantastic. So you still Let's ask, what about God? And I learned. Um, yeah. what, and what about, does it mean to be human? And what about his commands? You still, you still ask those kind of basic questions. Yeah. Um, awesome. Let's move into some, uh, there's some great practical questions here. Here's the first one. Is there a suggested order in terms of how to read the Bible? Um, should it be read chronologically or where should I start? Oh boy. This is where I would need to know where persons are coming from. Um, because I would suggest different starting places for different people. Why don't you speak to some of those? Because I think that would speak to a lot of people. Um, let's say, let's start with someone who's just beginning. I would begin with one of the Gospels. 
uh, so that I get to start to get to know Jesus first. Then I would go to one of the letters. Uh, no, 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 no. One of the gospels, the book of Acts, and then one of the letters. Then as I get familiar with how to do this, then I would go back to Old Testament and I'd read Genesis and Exodus. Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy are also helpful, but Genesis and Exodus, you get the kernel. Um, yeah, and then, 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 then email me and I'll tell you where to go from there. <laughs> What's the next step? But, um, I think that's where I would begin. Now, which of the four gospels to yes. begin with? And this is where I'd need to know who you are. If you are an activist, you're a business leader, you're, you're a can-do person, you just, you're, you're very active, start with Mark. Because it's in Mark that we find the word immediately, Jesus did. I think it's over 30 or 40 times. Jesus is the man of action in Mark. If you're the analytical, organized type, um, you're a school teacher, a lawyer, um, an accountant, start with Matthew. Because Matthew collects the teachings mm -hmm. of Jesus in five great sermons. He collects the deeds of Jesus in certain sections. Oh, beautifully organized. I'd love to do an evening on the, the beauty of Matthew's organization. If you are someone who's driven by um, the need for justice, a passion for the marginalized, start with Luke. Because that's how Jesus comes there. His parables on the Good Samaritan, um, the Magnificat that his mother sings, Jesus' sermon, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he brings good news to the poor. Luke mm -hmm. would be where you would start. If you are a person who is a more reflective, um, um, uh, I want to say mystic, but I don't. I, I want to avoid that, so I have to come up with a different word. Uh, but oriented towards um, wonder mm -hmm. and beauty um, and glory, then you want to start with John. Yeah. I love that. I love it as well in the sense that um, I think that doing something that connects with our personality serves our, our study, like our ability to lean in and, and like as we're asking those questions or we're looking for patterns, like certain personalities probably notice patterns better in specific books. So that's, that's awesome. Um, and I've never been given that instruction. I'm, I love that. Um, okay. This is simple, Daryl, and, uh, but maybe not simple. I should not preface things that way. Is there a preferred version to, to read and to study? And you might have um, a few different answers, but I guess uh, I'll expand the question and say, is there a um, preferred version to just read when I'm first reading the Bible? And then is there a prefer preferred version to study when I wanna dig in? Oh, good, good, good. Um, well, the, the one that's used most widely or has been used most widely is the NIV and the TNIV. Uh, today's NIV. NIV is what's called dynamic equivalent translation. You don't do a one-to-one -one translation uh, as much as a uh, you get the, the basic thought of the translation. Right. Uh, so if you, 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 yeah. So the NIV was written, oh, I, what is it now, 40 years ago? <laughs> the 84? I don't know. Yeah, it, it was written for people to read more easily. And it was written because it's easier to read out loud in public worship. Hmm. And, and so those were the driving forces of that. So it's still very readable. Um, I don't know the New Living, Living Translation that well, but what I have seen, I like the NLT. And again, that's a dynamic equivalent translation. So if you're just starting, um, one of those two. Now for study, that is, if you want to get, you know, just the, the, the details and the, the exact, then the NASB, the New American Standard Bible, which is the one I use, 
or the ESV, um, the English Standard Version, which sought to improve on the NASB. Um, the RSV and the NRSV, the new RSV, are also very good along those lines. Uh, so to have one of those easier read versions and then a study Bible that has these notes and little things yeah. like that. Um, that's fine. Yeah, so if you're going to sit down and really study passage, you probably need two versions. Now, that's where, of course, you can go to your computer because <laughs> it's all there. Uh, and, and they'll show you the difference and why the difference. Yeah, excellent. Um, here's so many great questions. Um, here's a good one. For people like me who get easily tired of regular rhythms, is there a, is there a way or ways to keep Bible reading fresh and dynamic? And uh, I think it, it's a very connected question. So I'm going to ask the second is, have you ever felt bored with scripture or tired of reading? And what do you do in those moments? So um, connected in that, yeah, times of like, ah, the rhythm's just feeling, it's feeling dry or just like, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm feeling bored with it. Don't want to go to it. What would you, what would you say in response to those questions? Well, on that first question, uh, again, I need to, I would need to know what's going on in the person's life a little bit more. But if the rhythm is going dry, two responses. Stay with it a little bit longer. Hmm. Ask the Lord to refresh it. And if, that, if he doesn't, then ask him, is there a better rhythm for me? Um, up until... Uh, where are we? We're in February. Up until October of 2020, I followed the same pattern since 1976. Uh, it's a four readings a day. I know exactly what reading is for most days of the year. But because of all that's going on in the world, and because of the bombardment in my mind of the different issues I'm wrestling with, I couldn't do that many. So now, I do a psalm, and I'm slowly working through John again. And I'm giving myself the permission to repeat. So, for instance, I stayed in Psalm 73 mm. for a week. Psalm 73 is the psalm about envy and bitterness that the arrogant always get their way. And, and what's the purpose in being pure at heart if the arrogant get their way? Mm. And right in the middle, the psalmist says, until I came into the sanctuary right. and I saw their end and I knew that the Lord was near and that he is my good. I had to stay with that because I've, I found myself very, very angry and very, very bitter at arrogant leaders in the last little while. And for my soul's sake, I just had to stay in that song. John, I've read John now. Uh, I don't tell this to boast, just to say I, I've lived long enough. I've read John 150 times. And I'm going so, slow through that. And I'm going, Lord, I never saw that. And I hear him say, yeah, you did. But not like I'm showing you now. Yeah. So I'm going through a slower process now. Now, right. will that get speeded up again? I don't know. But he showed me a different way for this particular season. So that's how I would encourage the person to go. Mm. Now, have I ever been bored um, uh, in those morning times? Um, no. He's, he's never let me down. Mm. Have I opened up my Bible to a passage and I go, oh, I don't want to read this today. <laughs> I know what's in there. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Me too. Yep. And what did you do, Jerry? What I did is I took that as a clue. That right. my soul is resisting something, and I have to read this passage. Right. And um, 
and, and, he, and he met me. Usually there's, there's something I'm hanging on to in my soul that he wants to get rid of. And the sharp two-edged sword of the text is going to go dig it out for me. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Um, there's a question about um, where to turn biblically when you're going through a season of depression. Um, I can just ask you that, but I also think with that, uh, if you want to speak any more to um, different places to turn based on different seasons, I know you, I, the personality thing in the gospels is really helpful, I think, for a lot of us. And just, I mean, anything on that, like depression, but then also, you know, how have you experienced different texts helpful in different seasons? That Psalm 73 thing really connects for me. Yeah, there are, there are books uh, beyond the Bible <clears throat> that will gather texts around themes. And so, and, and of course, those books now are on Google. So you, one could um, Google biblical mm -hmm. passage dealing with depression. Now, right. I, since we know, I, I know some of the Psalms pretty well, I would encourage a person to turn to the following Psalms. 42 and 43. It's actually probably one Psalm. Why, are you, oh my soul, why are you so disquieted in you? Why are you in despair? Psalm 139, where can I go from your presence? Mm -hmm. um, search me and know my heart. Why am I down, downcast? Um, so there are certain places you can turn in that way. Um, I think for the discouraged, it, uh, the first part of 2 Corinthians, where he, Paul talks about the comfort we're given. That, you know, in 2 Corinthians, I think it's in verse 9 or so, Paul says, we despaired of life itself. Can you imagine that? The apostle Paul wanted to die. He was so discouraged. But God brought him comfort. In, in that case, through Titus, through the friendship. And um, so that, that you, you know, you find out those passages. Yeah. Um, so that'd be one thing, is, is you, can, you can find out the list of where to, where to go. The other thing would be, though, is to pick a section of scripture and just stay with it. And trust that it's going to speak to you. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. the, the first time that I encountered depression was 1981 there was no reason in the world i should be depressed church was booming <sighs> wonderful wife we just adopted our first son beautiful child red hair bright as the sun uh everything's going right but i'm dying inside. and i did a number of different things but providentially I had committed to preach through the book of Romans that year. And working through Romans, which is the most difficult of Paul's books, forcing myself to work through that text was what took me through that year. Wow. Now, I have not preached the book since because it's too tender. Uh, it was part of God saving me through that wow. um, dark night of the soul time. Wow. So stay with it. He, he just stay with it. That's awesome. I think one of the big things I'm going to leave meditating on is just that giving myself permission to be in a certain place, which is so funny because here we are asking what are good guides? Like in one sense, we're like, I just need something to grab onto. But then I think a lot of us struggle with a weird kind of guilt. Like I probably should have read the whole book this year <laughs> or I, you know, I should probably should be reading more books or i'm probably missing something key and i think that word of give yourself permission to dwell and yeah, just dwell it's so, it's so good uh, and i think sometimes like there isn't a perfect strategy other than to dwell you know like like your romans it's not like that's some you know recipe for success every time that when a season like that so you, yeah. but it's just like following the lord and being like i'm gonna be here yeah and as i feel the lord ministering to me i'm gonna stay here and i I think that's um, beautiful and helpful. Daryl, one last question, um, but I'm going to preface it by saying that I don't even know if this is um, this is great advice, broad brushstroke or overall. But I sometimes for me, I will go, you know, in a season where I'm like, oh, I just need to be refreshed in the word. I'll read a book of somebody who's commentating on the Bible, and so not to embarrass you, but literally on I was on a holiday and I was reading your book. Uh, who is Jesus? And I was like, 
learning about what's he saying when I'm, he says, I'm the living water or I am the light in the, in the Feast of Tabernacles. And my, and my heart's refreshed, like, wow, Jesus is claiming to be the living God. And I saw it in a way I hadn't. Um, and so I do think, you know, there's, there's sometimes the thing that might not be appropriate to say, let it, you know, letting it replace Bible reading for a season, but at least it's a helpful add-on to Bible reading. And so what are some books that you would recommend um, as ways to either help us dive deeper into scripture um, or that would help us read the Bible better? And I know there's so many, but maybe like a top few that you would recommend. Um, this morning, uh, when I was down at the studio filming this coming Sunday sermon, Daniel and I were talking about this mm -hmm. and I had rec recommended that when I started reading the Bible in the 70s and 80s, I worked with William Barclay. Some of you um, a little older, you, you recognize that name at all? Bill, he's shaking his head. William Barclay did a great job. They were called a daily Bible study text. It's just a chunk of each. He'd have one book on every book of the New Testament. He, he's a linguist, so he'd bring out these word studies, and he's an, an historian, so he'd bring the background and do it very quickly. So um, we looked online to find out if, if you can get that. And it was $689. So we weren't going to recommend that. But what, what we did find out is there's a, there's a website called Study Light, L-I-G-H-T, not L-I-T-E, studylight.org. And they've got Barclay on there for free. I love it. So that would be a recommendation. If Excellent. you're stuck, read Barclay. Um, some of you, you've heard people refer to N.T. Wright. He now has Bible for e the Bible for Everyone series mm -hmm. that the publisher put together to replace Barclay. Um, and it, it's good. I, I've got this bias about Barclay because of because of the word studies. So that kind of a resource, the Bible exactly. Project, is a great resource to go yeah. on and see how they put together with their little cartoons. Oh, it, it's amazing. It's it's brilliant. Yeah. I think you would want to get, now this is probably online too. You're, you know, you're talking to this person who's trying to catch up with everything. Um, you, you, you can buy these one volume Bible commentaries that have commentaries on every section of scripture. It, it, it can't give you everything obviously, uh, but enough to answer the key historical questions and the key problematic texts. And so I've worked through a couple of these. Um, I won't recommend this one because it's an old one. They're new ones. Just go to a new Bible commentary. Uh, this one's revised, and now it's probably been revised, revised, revised. <laughs> and uh, you can probably get this online cheaper than um, in, in book form. Amazing. But, and you know what Daniel's doing for us is he's just dropping these links in the chat. Oh, bless so, him. So on top of it. Now, uh, we're, right. we're going through Ephesians. Yes. So I would recommend um, the message of Ephesians by John Stott, S-T-O-T-T. -T. You can see how marked up this one is. It barely holds together. I started reading this in the 70s. John Stott will give you word studies, background, but he's, he's the premier organizer. He can see how a text goes together. And I tell young preachers, when you're working on your sermon, don't go to Stott first because you'll want to do it just like he did it. <laughs> um, but that will give background and it's written for lay people. Mm -hmm. It's written for, you don't have to have a whole lot of yeah. theological or biblical yeah. background. Not so and one more thing while we're at it, uh, Jeremy, if you don't mind. Since Please. we're working through Paul and you've heard the name N.T. Wright, N.T. Wright wrote a book on Paul. Do you know this, Jeremy or Chris? Yeah, it's, a, it's a thick one. It's a thick one. Most of the books on Paul are very technical, and they're mm. wonderful. I love reading technical biblical theology. But what he's done is subtitle a bi biography. So he's written right. this as a novel. Cool. I, I just read that in about three or four days. I couldn't put it down. So if you want wow. to get a feel for Paul on all of his letters... That's awesome. And understanding the book of Acts, this is this would be dynamite. Yeah. So if I ever teach a formal course at Regent or anywhere else again on any of Paul's letters, this will be a required reading uh, just to get a feel for Paul. Right. Oh, I love that. You convinced me and hopefully a bunch more people. 
Um, Daryl, I'm gonna, we're going to um, wrap it up in a minute. I'm going to share a few announcements. Um, but before I do that, um, I just wonder if you could pray for us. This has been such a gift. And, uh, and yeah, if you could just pray for us around these things that as a church and then those and the wider church that we would um, dive in scripture, that we would find it as our dwelling place. And I uh, just love for if you could pray along those lines. <clears throat> Dear God, how grateful we are that you did not leave us to try to figure out who you are. That you have spoken. You have revealed yourself. In the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And finally and fully in Jesus of Nazareth. Thank you that we don't have to figure out who you are. And thank you that you've gathered your self-revelation in this wonderful book, the Bible. We don't need to tell you there are difficult parts we don't understand, but the, the major thrust of it we do. And so I, I pray that for each of my sisters and brothers on this call, that you would now shape a unique pattern of how to dwell in your word so that they see you and trust you more fully. Yeah. Thank you. Jesus loves me, this I know. For in the Bible, Jesus himself tells me so. Yeah.